My name is Charles Stevens. I'm a Brooklyn living in painting. Tell us about your relationship with art. Okay, uh, I'll do it chronologically. Um, that's the best way to do it. Um, it started when I was a, um, a kid. My family uh, are not artists. My father worked at General Motors his whole life. I'm not a worker. Mom's a housewife. And my siblings, I have uh, two brothers and a sister. They're not in the art world at all. Regular jobs. They all live in Texas. So. For me, it started uh, just, I was the kid in class drawing way too much with my head on the table, drawing on my desk, getting in trouble. Uh, then it moved um, onto comic books. I obsessively collected comics, watched cartoons. I was this close to the TV, yeah. probably why I wear glasses now. <laughs> then it went into, uh, uh, from comic books, it went into music, you know, turned 14, 15, getting into all these bands, their album covers, and the graphics, and the t shirts, and what they look like. And, you know, every kid does pretty much. Then I got to college and it became art history. Um, I started as an advertising major and saw this kid, Thomas Long, walking through school. Long black hair with a big clay gumby on his shoulders. And I asked my friends, what the heck does he do? Uh, he says he's a studio major. Uh, what does that mean? You make whatever you want. He said, you get a degree doing that? I said, yes. I seriously had no idea you could get a degree in studio art. Yeah. So I, not only did I change my major, I transferred schools. I went from Texas Tech in Lubbock to North Texas in Denton because they had a better painting professor, I heard. So I uh, transferred schools, and that was a life changer. Then getting out of school, it's the past 16 years, all those things I mentioned, I'm cycling back through but with the stuff I've learned in school and being a painter for the past 12 years. What I've learned doing that, working through all those art historical references, but now I'm going back to those like music and comic books and video games. I have a PlayStation and, yeah, a, yeah. and an Xbox and I'm 45 and I am immersed in my childhood in a strange way. And so that's why that's my relationship to art today. It'll change in five years, I'm sure. <laughs> I hope. <It> better. <laughs> can you can you cite any major influences? Um, yeah, the first ones were my parents. My father couldn't afford to go to art school. He was one of 12 siblings, and so in England, no way. So he would do these drawings, like draw half a horse or half of Donald Duck, I remember, and ask me to finish the drawing, which, looking back on it, that kind of stoked my uh, interest. Then, uh, then it was, uh, you know, the comic books, uh, Stan Lee, got to give him credit. I mean, he's a millionaire now with all the movies, but back then, comic books were like a revelation to me. Another big influence, uh, Bugs Bunny, huge on me. Um, but then artistically, you know, after, by the time I got to school, everyone. I mean, at first it was Andy Warhol, Salvador Dali, and Julian Schnabel, the big names. They got me in. But then when I... Uh, in, then I learned more and I looked at older art and everything interested me. I'm not trying to jump out of the thing, but I like everything. Yeah. I'm just getting to see I've never seen that in my life. I've never been to a museum until I was like 20. And so seeing it was like, boom, fantastic. So everything I saw influenced me. And then moving to New York, seeing all the work in person that influenced me in magazines and books totally yeah. changed my, the stuff I liked. In, uh, in books I didn't like in person, so that was, moving to New York was a whole new, a whole new relationship to painting and what, what affected me. Now, uh, like I said, I've gone back, music influences me today more than I I started playing music five years ago, I'm in a band with a friend of mine, and our first live gig is actually tomorrow night. <laughs> and I'm not a musician, but I love playing drums, okay. so we've just been doing that for, and it's a way of revisiting that passion I had when I was young, because I really liked music when I was a little young, and I, now I do again, a lot. I still love art, and I still look at it, and I'm, but I'm so involved in my own process that it's hard to admire anymore. It's, I'm just so convoluted and, and self-obsessed, I mean, I <laughs> I'm completely, I've been doing this professionally for 12 years, and the process is consuming, so I'm, it's hard for me to see or just the way I see it's hard to see with influences right now. But they're absolutely there. I'm not denying it. But there's just too many. It's like this massive salad. Yeah. <laughs>
tell us about your creative process. How, how do most of your pieces start out? Okay, that's key to how I make the work. The, they're labor intensive, and you know, little ones can take uh, weeks, big ones can take months, large, large ones can take years. So, I, what I do, I love an empty canvas. That's my process. Like, I don't make plans, I don't make sketches, I just get it all ready, put it in front of me, and sit on this couch and stare at it. And then get up and make a mark, and then respond to that mark. Every painting starts different. I make a point of that. Uh, the process I've developed of, if you will, finishing the paintings is similar in each one. So I'm not saying that I don't have a style, but each beginning of a painting is just me against the void. And that's the process. And then it's just this additive process of going into that, into that, into that. And that, it's very complex because it might be something I saw in the gallery, something I heard, something I saw on the subway. That'll feed into that day's work. You know, maybe something. You know, lately, here's what. Um, here's an example. You know, when you go to the subway and they tear off the posters, those are when they tear off and yeah. it's just the remnants. Yeah. I stare at those every day now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are interesting for me right now. I'll get sick of it pretty soon, but right now I look at those. I photograph them and just stare at them. They're, like that's a total accident, but they're visually beautiful. But I always find stuff like that. Right now it's the subway posters. Your, your, your painting technique can be described as poor painting, boring. Yeah. Uh, how and when did you stumble onto the technique? Um, well, when I, was in, when I was in school, I liked, like I said, I liked to draw, and when I got to school, I would do well in drawing class. Um, I, you know, drawing from the model, drawing still lives, drawing things that I was looking at. And I never understood abstraction, but when I started to study abstraction and see it, and see that people were making paintings like Jackson Pollock with sticks and putting it on the floor, again, I was like, you can do that? Every time I saw that what an artist was doing, I would say to myself, oh, I can do that. So I took pouring and spilling and all those process gestures that were so prevalent in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, I just wanted to try them. I just wanted to, wow, I can draw with a pencil, but what if I have this huge ketchup bottle full of paint and just squeeze it out? <laughs> what is that? That's like, it's so... I thought it was silly, but then I did it, and I was like, oh my god, this is fantastic. It was this, uh, this immediate way to dump out a bunch of paint. And when I first started doing it, I would just squirt it all over a painting like, you know, like a kid, yeah. painting in the snow. <laughs> And then that was enough to start a painting. I don't need a person to look at. I don't need fruit on a bowl. I can just go, eh, squeeze that up. But then I immediately said to myself, well, if you're going to do that, you can only do that once. And if you do it again, you have to change how you do it. So it became this uh, vocabulary gesture that I've developed. Now it's not just a squeeze bottle. It's, well, look at that. Go to Ricky's. Look at that bottle. Look at that bottle. Look at that bottle. Or what if I paint with a stick or the wrong end of the brush or use my left hand? That's what abstraction told me, that I can, I don't have to be this draftsman. I can be a pourer, I can be a splasher, I can be a dripper, I can, I can put paint in a, bubbles and blow paint onto a canvas, I can to put, take tools from other industries, auto industries, doctor's tools, hairdresser's tools, and use those to pour paint out. What are they, I don't know what they're saying, but that's what appeals to me. It's that void, it's this embracing something I have no idea what it's going to do. That, that actually actually brings us to our next question. Do you feel that that your your poor technique may pigeonhole you in the eyes of those who aren't totally familiar with your work? I think everything I do pigeonholes me um, in someone's eyes all the time. There's no escape from that. But the important thing for me, the reason each painting starts differently, is I'm not I try not to pigeonhole myself. But at the same time, no matter what I do. Um, my style, my look, my thing is going to come out. No matter how many times I try to be different, it's going to look like me. So I am inevitably pigeonholed and proud of that. Okay. <laughs> uh, you're legally blind, correct? Well, I like to say that because it sounds so dramatic, but I'm yeah. just, I'm incredibly nearsighted. But <laughs> legally blind to me just means um, you know, I have to wear corrective lenses. It says so on my license, but so does everyone who's, you know, Vision's messed up. But yes, I am legally blind, and I do make these incredibly detailed paintings. <laughs> but 
my distortion, and this is common to a lot of your side of people, is you know I take these off, I can't see far away. Yeah. But I can because of the distortion of my cornea, I guess, or whatever. I can see like the texture of the skin in my hand. When I read a book, I can see the texture of the paper. I can see like this close. So when I'm painting, I sit this close to my painting. Okay. That's where the look comes from, the detail. And then I, when I sit back like this, I put my glasses on so I can see. That's why I wear glasses and not contacts. So I can do this all the time. Okay. Because taking these things off, it's like, a, it's like an out of focus. It's like a Monet. I live in a Monet right now. Everything's hazy and fuzzy. It's this ever decrepit Monet vision. When I put these on, you know, it's normal, it's normal vision. But when I'm this close to the painting, I can see so well. I mean, I use tiny little brushes to make these things. And everyone says, do you use uh, jeweler's lenses? I'll only go as far as my, um, my dysfunction will take me. Okay. Okay. My eyes are just screwed up and that's what I do. Do you, do you feel like it, it hinders or, or benefits your work? I think it represents who I am, a fantastically original man. Uh, does it harm me in any way? No. Absolutely not. I've been painting now professionally for 12 years, so it doesn't harm me. <laughs> it's a tool I have. I use it, you know. Yeah, it looks like... Yeah. I mean, it's, it makes the paintings um, me. Well, it's, that's, they look like that because of me, not because I'm trying to look like something else. They, they look like that because my eyes are screwed up. And it's, a, it's satisfying for me personally to get up close and see all that detail. Wow, I'm convinced this is a good painting. And that's just my screwed up sense of what good means. Maybe because I can see all the detail. And maybe when I was really lit, my eyeglasses by the time I was six, maybe I needed them before that and didn't realize that maybe this is the way I originally saw. Yeah. I don't know. I think about this a lot, vision and stuff. And I've talked to, I met a painter recently who has the same detail aesthetic, and his vision is equally as bad. And I was like, whoa, this may be like, you know, look how detailed, bit like that man. I don't want to be that guy either, even though that's who I am. In my head, I could be worse. I could be that guy instead of that guy. I am that guy, but I could be that guy. Have you ever had, what's, what's the shortest amount of time? About an hour. I make those all the time. I call them hour paintings. <laughs> I don't show them because nobody likes them, but I make them. Usually every painting in here is one of those. I started, I'll spend an hour on it and go, boom, look at that! And then the next day I wake up and go, no! I wish I could be a minimalist. I wish I could just be my My favorite painters, Robert Ryman, Agnes Martin, minimalists. I wish I could do that. I just can't. I wake up like, no, 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 no. That'd be five or anything. Well, it's the comic books, it's the video games, it's the MTV, it's all the stuff in my head. I took it all in. So, some may look at your work as confusing of the way you share chaos. Exactly how much of your work is accidental and how much of it is on purpose? Um, process is on purpose. Um, a lot of the gestures are accidental, but I've uh, planned accidents. Like, you throw a paint around, you're not going to know exactly where it's going, but you know you've done it. Yeah. So, you know, there is a lot of chaos and layering, but uh, let me answer that question this way. They look chaotic and crazy relative to what happened in the 20th century in the abstraction. But I don't think they're as crazy as Persian rugs. I don't think they're as crazy as the Egyptian hieroglyphs. I don't think they're as crazy as Aboriginal painting. I don't think they're as crazy as illuminated manuscripts that monks used to make in the 15th and 16th century. I don't think they're as crazy as the Bible or the Koran. The detail of the layers in that stuff, I just think they look that way. They look crazy to people. I think they're very ordered and are beautiful. Like, to me, they look like uh, digital stained glass windows. You know, that could be a metaphor. And stained glass windows don't look, you see a really ornate one. They don't look crazy to me. They just look beautiful. I like, like, completely different colors. I think they look chaotic relative to 20th century abstraction.
Because we're coming out of a century, a century, a hundred years of complete reductivism. Yeah. And for me to do this, that's why I love it. That's why this is so fun for me, you're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to make decorative abstract. So mine are super decorative. Yeah, but I don't think they're chaotic. I just think most people's lives are rather boring. How that sounds really neat, I'm sorry. <laughs> That, that actually, that actually brings us to a question. How would you describe your work? In your own work? Um, people call, approach the work magnetically. And by that, I mean what they look like maps, they look like machines, they look like satellite images. I would describe the work as a painter attempting to work through abstraction, who was unfortunately raised in a predominantly pop culture environment and prioritizes the wrong things, but aspires to do the right thing visually. <laughs> um, fucked up. Painting is not fucked up. Painting is a noble thing. It's been around for it's one of the oldest things. We cave paint is one of the oldest forms of expression. It's beautiful. But you know, our pop culture is so trivial, so screwed up, so messed up. I can't even deal with it. That's why I like to spend so much time painting, because I don't have to deal with it. So I'm a confused painter, trying to make sense of it all with painting. And my paintings aren't communicating with anything other than that, in my opinion. I think my paintings will make sense in a hundred years when some young painter, much like myself, looks back after what's happened hundred years after it's been passed. They won't look chaotic at all. I think they're a phenomenal order to articulate this time quite well. Well, I hope. That's very grandiose. That's, <laughs> I think that's what everybody hopes, but that would, that would be nice. That would be nice. Let me put that. that, that, that uh, what, would you, what would you like your audience to take away? Punk revival really happening. We asked um, Gary Bushel from Sounds, and in case you'd forgotten punk, here's the anti no I know this is going to sound corny, but it's true. Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm for painting, enthusiasm for a life in if this is someone who is enthusiastic about painting. And if he was enthusiastic in this way, there must be something there with So it turns some kid who wants to be a financier into an artist. That's my goal. I want some young kid to say, Oh, I don't have to be a businessman. The world will be a better place. <laughs> it happened to me. I saw Andy Warhol and said, I don't do that. I'm not saying I don't want to work on it. Seeing an artist, seeing real art, someone who really does this, that's kind of strange. In my audience, I, think, I was always thinking about kids. I don't think so much about the critical audience. Because I don't think that would just depressing. They get me thinking about the wrong things too much. I think my audience, I think, is me and kids and people have been born. And someone said that. The artist's audience has evolved for a hundred years. I kind of like that. I think that's good. I like that idea that uh, paintings matter. Uh, but when I'm gone, I will be made fun of like the old thing. They go, tease, we cave people make cave paintings. We have to invent them because of what they're behind. That's how I see my research. That's how <laughs> I leave behind these signs, these billboards, to see in this room. <laughs> but I don't know. That's why I love it. It's the exact opposite of what pop culture where ego is so important. Paintings are no ego. Well, that's not true. A lot of painting is ego, but I love that it will be gone. They'll be here on gone. I think that's beautiful. That's another thing.